Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the DC Bar Pro Bono Center's webinar, Insurance Recovery for Commercial Property and Other Damage in the Wake of Civil Unrest. It's brought to you in partnership with Holland and Knight and Locked In Companies. I'm Daryl Maxwell, an Assistant Director of the DC Bar Pro Bono Center. Before we get started, I'd like to thank a few people. First, I'd like to thank Christine Kulamani and Lauren Paley of the Pro Bono Center for helping make all of this happen. Next, a huge thank you to our friends at Holland and Knight and Locked In Companies. Tom Bentz, an insurance partner at Holland and Knight, was not only happy to step forward and present on this very timely subject, but made sure to pull in his colleague, Peter Dean, a senior vice president and producer for Locked In. You can find more information for each of these gentlemen at the end of the presentation. I'd also like to start um, with a couple logistics for today. This webinar will be recorded. Additionally, you have access to the to the webinar. You you have access to this webinar in the and this control panel here on GoToWebinar. If you'd like to share the webinar with a friend, there will be a copy of this webinar on our resource site www.lawhelp.org slash dc slash ced. For questions, please use the question box in the dashboard on your computer. During the presentation, I will share questions with our presenters. Between the global pandemic and civil unrest, many businesses have been forced to indefinitely close or limit operations and have experienced lost merchandise and inventory or suffered property damage. Entrepreneurs, will, entrepreneurs need to determine how to work with their insurance companies to rebuild and reopen. Tom and Peter will lead an interactive discussion to help you understand the parameters of the insurance recovery process. They will also discuss what claims are likely to be covered or excluded, and if there are any associated risks businesses need to know um, to get some questions answered. Gentlemen, Tom and Peter, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Daryl. I'll start off with Tom um, Bench from Knight. Uh, and I uh, wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, participate in this, this panel. Uh, I, I personally am the co-chair of the insurance group at Holland and Knight, and I've been at Holland and Knight now for about 16 years. Uh, I also am the head of the DNO Cyber and Management Liability Group, uh, where I help clients understand their coverage. And then if they do have a claim, I help them navigate the, uh, the claim issues that may arise in order to maximize their insurance recovery. I'll let Peter introduce himself and then we can get started on the slide. Sure, thanks Tom. Good afternoon everybody. Again, my name is Peter Dean. I'm with the Lockton Companies. Been in the, uh, the property casualty business for just over 20 years now. I'm focusing on a broad um, array of different types of clients over my time. Um, as of late, I work with a lot of private equity backed clients, not for profits and real estate firms, um, simply because they have some unique um, coordination of coverage issues uh, that uh, need unique handling. And with that, I think this is a good group of people to bring forth kind of some of those experiences because with the COVID um, outbreak that we're dealing with, as well as some of the localities with the, the civil unrest, um, there have been some unique um, and very specific insurance questions that have come up. And um, I think that our goal here today is to kind of give a brief outline of what we're thinking and what we're seeing, and then really would like it to be as interactive as possible with, you know, a chat function. Um, but Tom and I will talk with each other. Daryl's going to chime in if he thinks of anything. Um, but, you know, as interactive as this can be, we'd like it to be that because I think that'll be the best way um, for people to get as much out of it. Tom, take us away. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I'm trying to get the uh, PowerPoint to advance here, Daryl. I, I don't know if it's uh, stuck or if it's just not happening here. But uh, we, we basically got, oh, there we go. We basically have uh, three main areas that we wanted to talk about today. One, uh, because we are in DC and because there were so many issues that happened, especially in and around the White House uh, with the, the you know, damage due to property, um, windows being broken, business being shut down, fires and other things. 
we wanted to spend a, a couple of minutes going through those issues and kind of outline some of the things that you could do to, to again, maximize your insurance recovery. Then we wanted to turn to what we really consider to be um, uh, the, probably a more difficult question and one that is probably on the minds of a lot of folks uh, here in this area again, and that's coverage for business interruption related to the pandemic itself. Um, still very difficult questions here, and we're happy to get through those and get through some of the main issues and, and again, help you try and position your claims uh, in, in the best way possible. And then I think we want to spend a little bit of time uh, as we go through this to really talk about what happens next. As DC and other places start to reopen, what are the issues that we're seeing? What are the things that companies are doing in order to minimize their risk, both to their employees and staff uh, and their invitees and customers? And so we'll go through some of those issues. And then we'll, we'll touch on, if we have time, a little bit of um, cyber liability exposure uh, for a lot of companies that are having people work from home, this has become uh, a fairly significant area of risk that we are seeing happen, uh, you know, that was not anticipated six months ago. So with that, let's, uh, let's turn to insurance coverage for the looting and the riot damage. And the good news is we're starting off on a positive note. Uh, we really do <laughs> see this as a, a mostly covered area of exposure. Um, you know, most general liability policies and property policies are going to give, not if not specifically named coverage for things like unrest and rioting, it'll fall within the all risk coverage. And you typically can get your, your, you know, recovery for everything from broken windows, doors, light fixtures. Um, if you have damage to the interior of your, your business, you can get coverage for everything from computers to office supplies and in between. Uh, Peter, I'll turn it to you and let you uh, chat about this for a little bit because I know this is an area that you, you spend a fair amount of time in. Yeah, so um, generally what Tom has shared with you is for, for most insureds in the greater Washington area should be true. What I want to take a step back is that throughout a period of time um, in the past, insurance costs were relatively low compared to how they were priced historically. In the last year or so, some costs have started to creep up or organizations have had upward pressure on their margins and they've been looking to shade costs wherever they can across their entire uh, platform. Insurance is often a place where organizations look to save money uh, and rightfully so. What I just wanna point out is everybody should go back and look at their insurance policy. Generally, if we're in something known as a business owner's policy for a smaller organization or a BOP, that could be like a Hartford Spectrum, TNA, or a Traveler's Package, where it's all bundled into one, it's um, set up as something known as a special form, which is, as Tom described it, unless it's excluded, it's generally included in civil um, unrest uh, and rioting are included there. But for those on the call that may have more difficult risks, whether it be some sort of unique um, smaller manufacturing in the district. We have some, um, some not-for-profits who have viewed that their risks were not very um, robust in property. If you're on what's known as a broad um, or basic form, which is unusual in the modern, modern um, insurance marketplace, but they are out there. Sometimes they're called fire policies. So those forms have named perils on them and this type of exposure needs to be named to it. So I wanted to jump off right off the bat and just let everybody know, is look at your insurance policies to get a clear understanding of what the contract says. They are legal contracts of adhesion and you have rights under them, but so does the insurance carrier. Um, and so sometimes um, we're unclear of what's covered. I think that's why we're having this call is everyone's a little unclear. Let's start off with understanding what we've purchased. Um, but generally, for the rest of the conversation, I'm going to follow Tom's lead to, in agreement, the vast majority of you have an expectation of this cover. Um, it is generally broken up into two major areas. There's going to be the property coverage, and then there's the business interruption coverage um, for direct physical loss. And then there's something called civil authority that's tied to business interruption, which I'll talk to later. 
physical damage due to um, a riot or a civil commotion clearly covered. Um, what we do there is if it's broken glass, if it's you know broken doors, stock has been looted, so on and so forth, the types of things that we see on the, on the TV, those are covered perils. To find out to, um, how much insurance you have or how to trigger it, you're generally gonna need to do two things. One, you're going to have to call the police and get a police report. Um, two, you're going to have to look at your lease with your landlords if you don't own the building you're in, because between your landlord and you, there are going to be different obligations if there's damage to the business. So in some cases, if your building has been physically damaged, your landlord may be responsible for fixing any broken glass or doors or facades and so on. In other situations, you may be responsible. So first step is look at your lease and get a police report. Um, that is going to be step one in determining um, the size or moving the claim forward. When, if and when you have a problem, you need to document everything as much as you can. Uh, take pictures, uh, measure, you know, you know, drawings, whatever you can, whatever's feasible in your type of business, document your loss from the very get-go. If we have a storefront or if we have a first floor exposure, um, one of the things that we would, uh, we have an obligation to do is to minimize future loss. So even though we're unclear of if it's our loss or our landlord's loss, if you have computers, desk, personal items, inventory that can be gotten to because of the damage, secure it, whether it means boarding up your space, moving the inventory, whatever um, you can do to make the loss as little as possible going forward after it um, discloses, A, there's an obligation under the policy to generally do that, and B, it's just good business, take care of your own, your own business. Um, so you keep those receipts, those will either go against your deductible or you will be able to probably, if it's the requirement of your landlord, um, be able to claw that back somehow from them. Um, when this is all done, um, the, the next phase is calling your insurance agent and calling your insurance carrier. Um, and making the claim is going to be the most, in this environment, one of the most frustrating things many of you are going to do. Um, depending on the size of, of your business partner and insurance agents of business partners, um, they're going to have various ex expertise and bandwidth to assist you in your claims. Um, many smaller independent agents are going to defer you to the carrier's 1-800 number, and that's totally fine. That's not them being lazy or, or bad. It's the process, uh, and they probably aren't going to bring a ton of advocacy um, to you other than making the first claim, getting you a claim number. Uh, it's just how it works. But um, what I would say is I would make it clear to our, our trading partner, whether it be a big, larger firm like Lockton, and then you know, a regional firm in the DC area or a small local firm here or elsewhere, what your expectations are and keeping your agent on the ball with you because they have their own relationships. Um, and before we go on to the next slide, that's just something I wanna put in the back of everybody's ear is um, you have a partner that will want to help you. They'll just be, have various levels of ability to help you. But build, you know, put your business partner on notice that you expect their help if you need it um, and keep them in the loop and hold them accountable. So I'm gonna take a pause there um, to see if Tom, if I've touched anything that you wanna jump on there. No, I think that that, that that last point is really important, Peter, is you know, you, you're gonna to have to be a self-advocate for some of this. And some, most of the checklist that we're going through and we will go through as we get through the, the business interruption part is really, helping you understand what, what do you need to keep track of, things that you probably didn't think about uh, in, the, in the process, in the normal process, if you haven't had a claim before, 
you know, what even records do I need to keep and, you know, how do I take photos or cell phone photos okay, are other kind of photos necessary, are videos needed? You know, all of the technology that we have on our phones now make this process a lot easier than it used to be, but it's still, you know, a process and you're going to want to do your best to preserve as much evidence as possible. As Peter said, making sure that you have the police report, making sure that you have um, the press releases. Uh, one of the things that I've seen right now is when you when you go to make uh, claims under the policy, having the press release or the governor or the mayor's uh, press release saying, you know, we're shut down, we're, we can't go, it, it does help in, in the process. Um, so I think we want to talk a little bit about business interruption. And again, we're seeing the business interruption that's caused by the civil commotions and looting to, as covered expenses. Um, we're going to get into the business interruption that's caused by the pandemic in a minute, but for, for now, focusing on the, the business interruption that's caused by damage to your property or damage to a nearby property or property that you can't access because, uh, for example, in Portland, you know, there, there are protesters that have taken over the area and prevent you from going into your building. Those we are seeing as, as a, an additional covered cost. Uh, if you purchase the business interruption and you have that coverage under your policy, as Peter said. Um, so, Peter, I'll, I'll let you jump in here again. Since, sure. Uh, you're doing so well. Ha. <laughs> so, the, the coverage that Tom is, re is referring to um, is civil unrest or civil authority. And what the civil authority coverage provides you as an insured is an extension under the business interruption or the property policy which is this, okay, my business has been damaged and I have physical disruption to my place of, of business. So I'm going to not be able to function the way I normally do. So therefore business interruption will, will for, the, for the sake of this conversation, cover the delta between what I should have earned and what my business actually earned at that particular time. And that is what business interruption will do. Clearly covered as we've gotten, um, a covered peril damaging our business. We're good there. So we have these rides that take place and say there is a, um, say there's a, the issue that happened in DC where the scaffolding was lit on fire and damaged. Say that that, that um, act damaged the building and it became unsafe. And so your business was around that a building that was almost destroyed, but it's uninhabitable and there was physical damage to it. The mayor comes in and says, we're going to close down the entire central business district of any city, but of, of DC, because that building is unsafe. And until we can get that building safe, we're just closing down the entire area. You have insurance for that as well. The point being is that if you are in an area um, that is located with another business or another location that had physical damage that would have been covered if it happened to your business, and the mayor or municipality shuts down the area, you have coverage. Now, there are limitations to it. There's a general waiting period of 72 hours on these policies. So if we're just talking about a day or two, you're not really gonna be able to see coverage. I mean, the situations that we're in right now um, on the East Coast, we haven't had this issue quite the same way, but curfews are included. So we have, they'll typically be it's anywhere from um, a month uh, to either 30 days or one month, depending on the policy form. So some carriers steal that day from you, but many days after the 72, waiting, 72 hour waiting period, you have a month of coverage for the civil authority where you can't get to your business or your business can't function. What we're working through right now are the curfews where companies um, or businesses have diminished um, hours. We have not seen these claims bear themselves out yet. So to be continued, whereas I'm not closed for 72 hours, but my business is, instead of being able to function for say 12 hours as my normal business, I can only function for six or eight. And so therefore I've truncated business hours due to a curfew. How do I get coverage? To be continued on how those are being um, adjusted because depending on your insurance policy, it's either 72 hours 
um, of continuous civil authority. Um, but there is an argument saying that if I lose six hours a day and this goes on for a week, I should get coverage. Tom's colleagues in the plaintiff's bar will probably bear that out better than I can on this call down the road. But the reality of that is for businesses that are considered small businesses under $50 million in revenue or, or, or enterprise value, um, we're chipping away at the edges there about the size of our loss. So for large organizations, it could be a meaningful number. For really Main Street businesses that um, we, are, you know, we represent, we work with, um, we're just nibbling around the edges. But there is cover there. It just mean you have to meet the dynamic. Tom, did that, that work for you? Yeah, no, I, and I think this really sets up the contrast um, as we slip into the the, chain, the difference between property damage and business interruption caused by the civil unrest or looting or damage to your building versus the coverage from the pandemic. And the, the first real big question that the carriers uh, announced was, you know, is the pandemic quote unquote property damage uh, as, as defined by the policy? And a lot of carriers um, and a lot of commentators put out information very early on, basically saying, don't waste your time. Every one of these policies has a virus exclusion. There's no point in even looking at it. Um, and that really hasn't been my experience, and I don't think it's been borne out in, in the reality. Um, now, I still think there's some real challenges to getting coverage for business interruption related to the pandemic. But uh, not as many policies as maybe the, the press portrayed it have that virus exclusion. If you have the virus exclusion, I think you're, you're going to have a hard time getting into your coverage. If you didn't have the virus exclusion, um, if you were with a carrier that wasn't using ISO or standardized forms, um, I think you have a much better argument. I think it's still a tough argument, but it's a much better argument than if you had the, the specific virus exclusion. Um, We've also seen people uh, try to make a claim under the civil authority argument, which is essentially, you know, we weren't able to go to our property because of the mayor's order saying, you know, you need to stay home and quarantine. Um, I think this has been a tough argument as well. We've seen a lot of different positions. I mean, I think there's over 600 law lawsuits that have been filed already. Uh, many of which are mass or class actions trying to get coverage. We've seen in uh, other jurisdictions like in Europe and in Canada and other countries, um, you know, where the courts have been somewhat more sympathetic. Uh, in the United States, we've seen a couple of cases start to trickle in. And in the United States so far, all of those cases have been in favor of the insurance carriers and not the insured. Um, that said, I do know that a number of, of uh, insured specifically purchased pandemic-type coverage, and uh, those policies have actually responded. Uh, it, things like event cancellation and other things that were caused by, um, you know, the, the COVID-19 crisis. So, you know, there, it, it really the point is you really need to look at your policy. You really need to know what it says and what it doesn't say um, in order to figure out if you're going to have the potential for coverage under the, the COVID exposure for business interruption. Yeah, Tom, let, I think it's worthwhile just to give everybody because to understand a little bit of, of the carrier's position on this and the background of how we got here, because this is not an argument between insurance carriers uh, and policyholders. That is, is uh, in my opinion, and, and, and talking um, nefarious or adversarial. Um, many insurance carriers um, have the virus exclusion, as you, you mentioned previously, very, for the very reason that this is a huge problem for the world. Um, and the insurance, the North American and European insurance industries went through um, some significant claims with Ebola, uh, and Zika was actually a very large one here in North America. And after the, the Zika outbreak, particularly in Florida and the Caribbean, 
the insurance carriers in North America made a choice um, to file endorsements with the carriers to say, this is not something we are financially equipped with to deal with. It's not that we wouldn't if we could, if we could charge for it, but we can't because from a property standpoint, which we're all talking about here with business interruption, there's not enough um, critical mass in the marketplace for me to be able to absorb those losses and pay out. One of the, the, the dynamics of the situation that has brought spread that um, many people, particularly um, in some of these cases, has been that insurance carriers are part of the capital market. They're, they are for-profit entities, if they like it or not. Um, and it makes them function in a very linear way. And you very clearly can understand what they're doing. It's not that they're mean, it's how they intended to function. And it's up to us to share that with our clients and make them understand that. Yeah, the, and I think that's a good point, what, Peter. I think, I think if you look at it, you know, if you look, talk about other kinds of natural disasters that cause big losses for insurance carriers, they still are in that market. So, you know, a fire in California or earthquake or, you know, flooding, whatever it is, they still write that because they can spread that risk over a large population that isn't going to have the same natural disaster at the same time. With the virus or any type of pandemic, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, countrywide or even global loss. And there's no way to write enough coverage where you could pay out that loss if everyone's hit with this type of uh, experience at the same time. And, you know, I think the carriers are, are really struggling to deal with that. And, and the insurers obviously are struggling to handle the losses. But, you know, if, if, if anybody had written this and specifically intended to cover it, they'd be paying out, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, I mean, but it was tens of billions of dollars a day that they were, you know, not going to be making anywhere near that uh, in premium. Correct. So the dynamic that I think is important for the group is to understand why, because there are many cases, excuse me, that, that insurance carriers will, will um, they lose in the gray area. So if an insurance policy is ambiguous, and to Tom's point, there are many insurance policies that do not have a virus exclusion in them. And there's some ambiguity in the concept of do we have property damage or not? And those are the arguments that are going on. And those court cases need to be fought and borne out. But there's some ramifications to everybody's um, insurance coverage, which is to Tom's point, the insurance industry estimated that for businesses, um, the small businesses in America, where we were talking about legislation, that any company um, that had fewer than 500 employees would get mandated business interruption coverage. And that was going to work out to be about $385 billion a month. Now that number has vacillated from 350 billion, all the way up 385 is the high. But the point where that, that's per month, the total property casualty reserves for the industry for 2020 was 900 million. So the magnitude of, the, and we talk about that because the insurance carriers are not going to be able to function for anybody um, if they're, we look to them to be the sole remedy. There will be places that, um, where they are the remedy. Event cancellation, absolutely. Um, we're watching the litigation. If there is coverage determined that, particularly if you have a Lords of London form uh, or as your lead, you know there is no virus exclusion in that those forms and many large broker manuscript forms and don't have it as well. Um, but I just think it's important for everybody to understand on this call, um, this is a, a decision or that could put insurance carriers that are common names in a very precarious financial position. Hence, one of the reasons why they're being so careful. Yeah, so and I, I just wanted to put that, that out. I, I think you've seen that come to bear as, you know, there was probably a, uh, close to a dozen states that have proposed very serious and very detailed legislation on, you know, forcing carriers to pay. Some of them were stronger than others. Some of them were, you know, backstopped by other programs. Some of them were, you know, we're going to make you pay regardless of whether or not you have a virus exclusion. Uh, and even in the federal government, there was a proposal to, to force payment as a way of trying to shore up. The, the exposure and all of those bills have stalled and it is in my my opinion probably unlikely 
that any of them will pass. Um, you know, there has been some talk about a, a, a backstop, some, something similar to TRIA, which is the Terrorism Reinsurance Act, um, something similar for a pandemic. The, the one thing that the government, and, and this is at both state and federal level, did recognize was that insurance carriers were probably in a better position to, to manage um, adjusting claims and paying out claims than the federal government has been. Uh, and you've seen some of the issues that have come up with the uh, Payroll Protection Act and, and other programs where you know millions of dollars were going out, some of it to people that probably didn't deserve or qualify for it or weren't intended to get that kind of protection. Um, and so I think that there may be some potential for a movement on that side. Uh, and, and obviously it's too late for, for what's happening now, but I do think that going forward that that may be something that both carriers and the federal government may be able to get behind. Good, I agree. So um, all that being said, I, I do think it's important <laughs> to point out um, we, we, we have had several hundred cases filed in various jurisdictions across the United States. And because of that, I do want to run through just a couple of things that I think will be important because if, if we do get a case uh, with a sympathetic jury um, and it, it stands up, you know, there may be some ability for business owners to make a claim under their policy. And, you know, kind of going back to Peter's point where some of these carriers, even very well known carriers, could be in a precarious position if that happens. Uh, I think you want to be ready and have made a claim uh, so you're in line early and that you don't get cut out uh, as the money dries up before you get your claim processed. And so, you know, you also may have some obligations under your policy to report losses and report claims as soon as practical or some other similar language within a certain number of days uh, if you have a loss. And that makes it really, really important to keep track of whatever expenses that you have. To the extent that you have any hope of getting coverage, um, you know, making sure you've documented your losses and kept track of things like, you know, the government orders like we talked about, um, making sure you've, you've informed your broker and, you know, from, because we're all working from home, making sure you know who your broker is, making sure you have their contact information so you can find them, making sure you have your insurance policies, so you know which policies you need to notify and, and under what circumstances you need to notify them. Um, things that you probably hadn't thought about in the past. I've always said, you know, when it comes to notice, uh, you, in your car, everyone has your, your, your insurance information and everybody just leaves it in their glove box so that if they ever have an accident in their car, they know exactly who to call. Um, fairly few people do that when you know, your building is gone, all your records are inaccessible because you can't get into your building um, and you don't have it electronically so you can't access it from your, your home personal computer device or your phone or whatever else. So you know, having that information around and available is really important and I think this is a good um, example of why that is. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of list here a number of different policies that can become relevant and again, all of these policies could be something that you need to put on notice depending on what your losses are. Uh, so you should have all of the information about those policies or at the very least, the information of, about your broker so you can find those policies um, in the event you need to make a claim. Um, we, I can go through these quickly. The you know, commercial property policy for your business interruption and continue, contingent business interruption claims your general liability policy for any bodily injury, uh, emotional distress, property damage claims. Um, if you have any employees that are injured or claim to be injured because of uh, COVID related issues or other issues, um, you need your worker comp information. Uh, if you have an event cancellation policy, obviously. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about cyber later, but we've seen a huge increase. It's like a 700% increase in the number of attacks um, on personal computers because the bad guys are going where it's easiest to go. A lot of people working from home 
don't have the same kind of protections that uh, you would have if you were in the office. You don't have IT monitoring as closely or even being able to monitor. Um, and so those are things that we have seen a humongous increase um, in, in activity in. Um, similarly, if you get uh, claims for breach of fiduciary duty by the directors and officers, your DNO policy could respond. And we've seen a couple of those come in already. Um, if you are in, you know, depending on what your business is, you may have rent loss, builder's risk, errors and emissions, or even employment practices liability as well. Hey, Tom, let me jump in there real quick. Um, sure. Two, uh, two things that I wanted to identify that uh, are often questions for um, tied to the property damage or, or how to measure the loss, but think about the loss for property first, workers' compensation, and then the jail. There is a not so subtle difference with the carriers uh, and your, your position if you've had a hot case in your building or your location. So if you have an employee that has been in your business that has tested positive while on the site, while at the office, while in your store, um, that is a not so subtle difference to I'm shut down because the entire world is shut down because of COVID. So in that particular case, in my opinion, I follow Tom in making that claim um, because if you can clearly say, I I've had it in my building, I've had to um, clean my building, which some of you may have that cleaning limit also, which is tied to this for a business interruption. But some of you may have um, a, a limit tied to your, your property policy to clean your, your space. Um, it may be below your deductible, but it may not be. So that'd be another place is that cleaning your building if you have someone who has tested positive in your space is relevant. With that being said, with workers' compensation, currently in the district, it's my understanding of time, I don't think it's changed. Um, it's not like California, um, other than healthcare workers, where it's still on the employee to prove or to demonstrate that they got sick because of or at work. Um, as part of your workers' compensation, you have employer's liability, uh, which would cover you for liability uh, if an employee came back to you and saying, I got sick because of your myth, mal, or nonfeasance in keeping my workspace hygienic and safe. Um, the third is general liability. Many general liability policies have virus exclusions in them, but many of them don't, to Tom's previous point. This is going to defend your organization and individuals if there are third parties, whether they've been uh, not they're all not employees because they have workers' compensation and employees' benefits liability, uh, or employers' liability, excuse me. Um, but third parties who feel that they got sick because of your, your actions or not actions. Your general liability policy, um, if those people make an allegation against your organization, um, may respond to defend you at least and then possibly pay any loss settlement. Um, I haven't seen a ton of these claims yet, but you bet your biffy, for lack of a better term, that they're going to start coming in soon as people financially get more strapped. Uh, and that's a not, no, not so subtle dynamic of where we are right now um, is as this continues, individuals and organizations are going to change their behavior because they have no other avenue. Um, so the claims behavior that we've been seeing from employees and third parties may change um, with valid arguments and not so valid arguments, uh, but worth mentioning and putting in the back of everybody's head. So if you have a dynamic where, you, you know, somebody who's an employee claims to have gotten sick at work, put your workers' comp carrier on notice. General liability, if you, someone has said they got sick due to your actions at your location or otherwise, put your general liability carrier on notice as well. Same thing as if you've had a, uh, someone in your space who works for you uh, that has been ill at your location, put your carrier on notice. Yeah, I, I think we're gonna see a lot of dispute over this because I think it's gonna be extraordinarily difficult for people to prove where they became exposed to the, the, uh, the virus. 
other than if, in, unless you have a, a large outbreak um, similar to the, the meatpacking cases where, you know, it was, it was fairly clear that, you know, 20 people got it all from the same location. Um, but especially with customers, I think it's going to be really hard for a customer to come in and say, I got it here. Now, you know, we're, we're still looking at contract tracing um, to see, you know, what works and what doesn't. But in general, um, I think the only thing, the only place that I know of at this point was that there was a beauty salon, a barbershop, um, where they were able to show that, you know, a number of people were exposed. And interestingly enough, um, it, it appears that the people that wore masks uh, were, were actually not impacted by the, the virus, um, even though the, uh, the several of the beauticians were, uh, the, uh, the customers were generally not impacted. So that was a positive development. Um, so the important thing about the general liability in that dynamic, and I completely agree with you, Tom. No argument, you're absolutely right. It's hard to prove with a zealous um, plaintiff's bar or attorney that um, has the time, they may bring the, the allegation anyway. And if there's no virus exclusion under a general liability, an insured should have the expectation of at least defense in that scenario. It doesn't have to be a valid suit. It could be utter nonsense. Um, but the general liability has no deductible uh, in many cases there should be an, a moderate expectation that it would respond to defend you if need be. That's all I'm saying. No, I agree with that. Absolutely. Um, so, Peter, I don't know how much you've seen of this, but one of the things that seems to be coming up more and more is, you know, what, what are best practices for reopening? What do I need to do? What kind of disclaimers do I have? And then what happens if employees don't want to come back? And, you know, that kind of opens us up to two different types of claims, really. Uh, one, um, your standard employer practices claim. You, either you said, I could come back and I didn't want to, or I wanted to come back and you brought back someone else, and now I'm going to claim discrimination based on age, gender, race, or whatever other uh, protected uh, qualification. Um, I don't know, Peter, if you've started to see any of these cases or if uh, you had any thoughts on that. So we have actually. Um, what we've been actually starting to see um, in earnest um, are cases where organizations have looked at their business through COVID and have had to make changes. So they've had to let people go. They, you know, they're, they're tightening their belts because they don't know what the next 12 to 24 months are going to be. And so what they've done is they've made um, They've let people go. And now these are people who are now, some of them, many of them have gotten significant severance packages, but they have an allegation or an argument saying that I was let back, I was let go because of um, my protected status, uh, whether I was a minority or I was too old or whether um, I was another protected class. And so what we're seeing is that, and I tie this back to the prospects of finding work right now are very difficult. So when you're letting people go, I feel that in many cases where they're going to go is an employment practices type claim or an EOC right to sue letter um, seeking benefits if they have some protected status. Those things need to be bared out because they're going to be many cases that are, we just let people go because we had to let people go. But I, this is the cynic in me, but there are going to be cases that have merit out of that where people or organizations um, may use this um, this pandemic to let go of people that they found they otherwise wouldn't have because of the complications tied to it uh, or, or perceived complications. So we are seeing employment practices claims in earnest um, across um, the, the the spectrum of organizations, um, and that's how we're, we're we're seeing. That's where we're really seeing them. Um, another place where yeah. we're seeing, do you want to talk about D&O claims, um, which sure. is really more sure. your area than mine? Well, we, you know, for, for D&O claims, for, for private and not-for-profit, there is some coverage for the entity. For public companies, the, the coverage is typically limited to securities claims. Um, so, you know, we, we haven't seen a ton in the private company space yet. 
Uh, first of all, most companies are protected by the business judgment rule. Uh, so if you made uh, careful consideration of whatever issue and you've made a decision whether it's right or wrong, uh, you have that protection. I will tell you that it's more important than ever to document the fact that you actually considered it, uh, whatever the issue is, that you've made an informed decision. Um, there's there's a case law out there from the, the Disney case, uh, you know, that basically says you're only entitled to the, the, the business judgment rule protections if you you can document and show that you made an informed and intelligent decision. Um, it doesn't have to be the right decision. It doesn't have to be a, a good decision. It, it just has to be uh, an informed decision. So, but I think for, for most small private and, and not-for-profit companies, this is not going to be a, a huge area of exposure. No, I, I agree. Where we've seen a dynamic start to arise um, in the DNO realm is tied to firms uh, that have um, disclosure requirements, whether it be to investors publicly, or even if they've got venture partners or private equity partners that are investors in them. Um, whether it be those private S equity funds um, and investors uh, portraying their exposure to their LPs um, not quite accurately and, and trying to smooth over their relative exposure to, the, to COVID um, or the platform companies not being completely forthright with their, their funds. So that's where we're, and I think that there's a, a lesson to be learned there um, for not-for-profits and privately held companies, which generally run very differently but is the if we have an economic impact due to the pandemic, um, whether it be from our executive team or our board, is be honest about it. Um, because if we're, we're starting to see the claims where people forget the business judgment rule, um, they just didn't, they thought it was going to go away and they made a unilateral decision and they were wrong. Um, there was no judgment to Tom's point. They just did it thinking it was going to disappear. And um, don't do that because <laughs> the insurance yeah. will struggle to the respond DNA. because it's going to be an intentional act. So insurance will not be there necessarily to indemnify. Yeah, the, the Dino cases that we've seen so far have really focused on companies who either downplayed or flat out misled um, the public about how safe it was to, to participate or come into their business or use their services. And those are the ones that I think are, are likely to cause more issues. Although that was all at the very beginning of the, the pandemic when you know you could probably fairly easily convince people it was safe. Um, that may happen again towards the end when, you know, after a vaccine is, is developed and people are getting vaccinated and you know those those issues. But um, I could see I could also see, you know, there's a lot of advertising now about my establishment is safe. We, we do all these extraordinary things to sanitize and to clean and to keep social distancing. And then you have the videos uh, showing that, you know, people are standing next to each other. There's no masks being worn. And, um, you know, it, it really kind of flies in the face of what they're saying publicly uh, and what they're doing privately. So Absolutely. The, 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 the last topic that we wanted to touch on, um, and I, I, this is fairly quick, and then we'll, we'll see if we have any questions, um, is, is really talk a little bit about, you know, to the extent you have your employees uh, working from home, what are the risks and what are we seeing in that area? And, you know, right now, uh, I have seen, like I said at the beginning, uh, about a 700% increase was the last number that I saw in the number of attacks on um, home computing systems. Um, and interestingly, one of the things that has been somewhat problematic is that some of the smaller uh, cyber policies that are out there have very uh, specific definitions of what constitutes a computer that's insured by the policy. And uh, the specific language that we're concerned about is, is you know, you're, you define a computer as the, the device that's owned or leased uh, by the by the entity. So if you're working from your home laptop and that's neither 
owned nor leased by the entity, uh, is that a computer as defined by the policy and is there coverage uh, if your computer is, is the, the device that's been hacked and allows someone to now access protected information. Um, again, not sure, you know, when we talk about uh, uh, pro bono uh, com companies and, and smaller private companies, some of you may have very large donor lists, uh, you may have less credit cards, you may have other uh, information that may be protected, uh, or you may um, be running a lot of credit cards for your restaurant or whatever other business that you're, you're, you're running. So this may be an issue um, as, you know, your employees may or may not be, or your, your managers or your, your directors or officers try to, you know, access that information from their home systems. You know, the, I'd also add to that, Tom, is um, employee information. So this is an internal issue yeah. for coworkers and employees as well as third parties. Yeah, so I think that's a good point, Peter, and, and what I missed on that is, you know, uh, as HR tries to figure out how to make payroll uh, and instead of accessing their, you know, their all that employee information from their home computer, that could be a, a real issue and one that can get you into fairly significant trouble with the, with the law. Yeah, agreed. See, look so at us solving look, problems. Was, sorry, Peter, go ahead. Look at us solving problems. <laughs> Indeed. So I, I, that was what we had for our presentation today. I, um, Daryl, I don't know if we have any questions, if we can see them, but uh, we would like to, you know, save a couple of minutes here for any questions that you may have. And then uh, if, if you would like, after we're done, uh, we're more than happy to uh, respond to questions. If you wanna shoot us an email, uh, everyone's contact information is on, on the presentation, which you should have access to. And uh, we, we hope you uh, enjoy the presentation. Awesome, thank, well, thank you guys. I just wanted to say, I, I wanted to make sure to highlight or to amplify one thing that you said, the one of the most difficult things or in, and one of the best sort of pieces of information we try to share with um, clients is make sure you know where your insurance policy is and who you're working with. And we can we can never stress it enough. Um, it is the, one of the most, most common problems people have um, in mid-sized organizations is they have no idea who to call or where to start. Exactly, exactly. Um, so one of the first questions I had or, or uh, one of our uh, listeners had was for, you know, for somebody who maybe owns a, a, not a commercial space, they might own, like, you know, they're renting out a house and um, due to sort of rental moratoriums, they're trying to figure out sort of if they can, you know, if they're either not allowed um, to rent their place or they can't transfer over, a, you know, an apartment maybe um, because of the government's moratorium, can they access, you know, is business interruption an, an option? Generally, so, you know, in the commercial real estate space, we're seeing this a fair bit with, with moratoriums, uh, you know, evictions and rent forgiveness, so on and so forth. Uh, generally, if you are working something out with your landlord, um, it's a business risk. Whether it be, I can't rent my space because they're not letting, letting me, um, or I'm not, or nobody will rent it. Generally, no, that's what we would call a straight business risk. Um, because there's no trigger. There's got, right, we still haven't figured out the dynamic of direct physical damage. So whereas my business has come to a halt, my opportunities have come to a halt because of COVID, if I don't have an allegation or even some concept of physical damage to my space, the policy or the definition of an occurrence under a policy isn't, isn't triggered. So um, I would, it's not a great answer, but I would be hard pressed to think that there would be any remedy under an insurance policy in that remedy. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would just add on that, to the extent that you, you make a deal, uh, and we saw a lot of this in the commercial real estate area, where landlords were kind of accepted the fact that, you know, their tenants either weren't gonna be able to pay or weren't going to pay, 
Um, and so they decided to make a deal such as, you know, we're going to forgive you three months rent. Um, that is, is problematic from an insurance perspective because if you were able to get a, uh, insurance coverage, um, this would probably not qualify as a loss. It would qualify as a business decision to work something out. So our, our advice in that situation was generally speaking to uh, not abate the rent, but to extend the payment term. So instead of giving up three months rent, saying we'll add three months to the end of your lease. Uh, and again, to Peter's point, making sure that you have the documentation saying that you um, didn't have a choice with respect to the to collecting the rent because of the government orders. Thanks for that. I, I, I had another another question. I wanted to ask if you know, as you're trying to figure out whether or not, um, or as you're looking at losses for damage, and then also if you've had to be if you've had to be to have been closed for a period of time. I know you're, you're sort of typically going to be sharing sort of what your losses are, but are you also going to be sharing sort of a, an explanation of year one year versus a different year, like maybe tw 2020 versus 2019 information? Yeah, I think you're going to see it both ways. You're going to say this is what my revenue was last month, and this is what we projected and uh, and expected, uh, and this is what we did last year, and all of that's going to be used as your your basis of proof. Um, I know for a lot of businesses, 2020 was shaping up to be a very positive year for the first quarter, um, maybe even more so than what they had in 2019. And those businesses have used that um, improvement to, to try and argue that they would have had a better second quarter as well, but for the, the, the pandemic. So I think you, you know, that's another thing that as you put your claims together, and you need to document the the uh, losses. That's something that is going to be really important to be able to to show. And, um, let me just add a little colors that business interruption losses, even if there's clear uh, clear coverage grant for physical damage, they are one of the most highly contested claims um, in the insurance realm. There, the, the bigger they are, the messier they are. Uh, and hence why, and what I wanted to add was, if we get to a place where we have a business interruption claim that is deemed to be covered, with look in your insurance policies as well, um, and depending on the size of your, your organization, you should have a professional serve or professional fees um, cover into in your property policy, where it could be as low as $25,000, but it could be up to a million dollars. And what that will cover, if it's a larger number, a Forensic accountant um, could cover um, a third party claims advocate, um, and it can be spelled out what's, what is covered there. But for larger organizations, you'll have something built into your insurance policy that will pay for you to help um, figure out the cost uh, or, of your loss. Uh, because what you should have made versus what you could have made, especially if it's seasonal business or you're, on your, you're ramping up and say you're at hockey, you know, hockey stick growth. Those are valid arguments to claw back a larger amount of money from your insurance carrier. So just because, you know, 2019, to Tom's point about 2020 was a banner year compared to 2019 and 18, um, if there's, you know, affirmative cover, that larger number that you were projecting in your model is a valid argument to claw back a larger amount. Thank you. No, those are really great, great points. And, um, I think with that, we're just at time and we don't have any more questions right now. But as I mentioned in the chat, um, for those of you who, got, who may have questions after, I, I made sure to give a link um, for folks who need to get some advice. It's probono.center uh, slash damage loss advice. Um, and uh, with that, I am going to virtually applaud Tom and Peter. Uh, thank you guys so much. For <laughs> taking the time to be a part of this. Um, for all the participants listening, we will be sending out a survey um, to your email boxes. You'll be getting that very soon. If you need any additional assistance, you can always email the Pro Bono Center at cedinfo at dcbar.org. 
Um, and again, you can find um, webinars like this at our resource site, www.lawhelp.org slash DC slash CED is where you'll find us. Thanks again uh, to Tom and Peter for joining us. Thanks to Holland the Knight and the Lockton Companies for, um, for partnering with us. Stay safe out there. Be careful. Thanks again. Have a great day.